Would it be fair to say then that 95% of the time, nasal breathing is what we should be doing? But there are certain situations where there's an emergency switch, such as an increased requirement for more volume of air. The, 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 100 meter, the last 10 meters of your 100 meter sprint, swimmers, for example, swimmers usually have their nose. They don't breathe through their nose. They breathe through their mouth when they come up for air. They breathe through, can you breathe through your nose when you're swimming? So yeah, so say for example with swimming, your breathing and swimming is influenced by your breathing outside of the pool. Okay. The same with any athlete. You know, if you have an individual who's walking down the street with their mouth open, sleeping with their mouth open, breathing a little bit faster and a little bit more upper chest, they have this, they are the traits of dysfunctional breathing. That breathing pattern isn't going to suddenly improve itself in the pool okay. or on the pitch or on the race. So that's where we need to look at everyday breathing. We need to look at everyday breathing, but also how do you breathe during the physical performance? Okay. Um, now, swimming in fairness is the best sport in terms of adding an extra load onto your breathing unless you do your physical exercise with your mouth closed. Because when you swim, your face is in the water, yeah. which is forcing you to breathe less. When you swim, your body is breathing against resistance because the water is pressing against you. So you're adding an extra load onto the diaphragm. Like, if you think about athletes here in Ireland, everything is being trained except their breathing. And, you know, you can use breathing as well <coughs> as a means of preparing that person physiologically and psychologically before they go into competition. You know, what do athletes do? Cognitive training. Of course, it's brilliant, but it doesn't address underlying respiratory physiology. You know, I'll give you an example. I had a meeting in London, May. Um, it was a high powered meeting. You've got five very, very high powered individuals. Seven cameras. An interview that went on for an hour and a half. I was the only one there. Of course, a lot of questions put on me. They, I was brought to the studio at 12 o'clock that day. I was left in a small room, maybe, you know, a very small room until five o'clock that evening. I came out a couple of times to see the set. And uh, at five o'clock then I went out towards the studio and I was waiting for the studio door to open and uh, I was waiting there for seven minutes. And all of this was designed to stress me psychologically and physio physiologically. And as I stood there, one of the executive producers says, take a deep breath. And I says, no, I'm not taking any deep breaths. And I could feel my heart rate increasing. And of course, once you notice your heart rate is increasing, now you know you're going into the stress response. And the problem with a stress response is that if it's too much, your brain is here to protect you and all your brain wants to do is get you out of the situation. So I had to make sure that I brought balance to my autonomic nervous system before I went in. And I only had about 30 seconds to a minute at that point. And I simply took a soft breath into my nose and a really relaxed and a slow and a gentle breath out. You don't even have to time it because you're taking a soft breath in and a really relaxed and slow, gentle breath out relative to how you were breathing at that point. 